Good morning, everyone. This is Chaitali Bagh from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. And this morning, we are going to have a very important discussion, which is going to interest all of you. The world today is witness to one of the biggest fear of war between two CIS nations with fast spread global repercussions. Russia and Ukraine are on the brink of a conflict and are synergial of all eyes. We have with us Lieutenant General Sayyid Atta Hasnan, former Corps Commander 15 Corps of Indian Army, to give us a comprehensive insight into the most important and continuously developing geopolitical story with focus on China's role in this conflict. Sir, welcome to ADU's chat room. And now I hand over to editor ADU, Sangeeta Saxena, to steer the conversation ahead. Thank you so much, Chetali. Absolutely wonderful to have you, sir, on the show again. Always a pleasure, sir. Thank you and, so much, uh, and Jai Hind this, to all our viewers. Right, sir, Jai Hind, sir. And I'm sure our viewers will be very happy because uh, you've always been a very, very insightful, you know, uh, actually a teacher for all of us. You know, there are things which we really do not know, we really want to understand, and we want our viewers to get that comprehensive insight. And today, sir, like Chetali introduced, and she said that we have one of the most important stories, the biggest geopolitical story. And sir, uh, you know, everybody understands that there's something going on between Russia and, uh, and Ukraine. Russia very happy with its, uh, you know, old friend China at the moment. And uh, also that, you know, we want to understand that uh, what Russia does not want what it wants, we, I think the audience knows, but what it does not want is a very major story. So let's begin with it, sir. What does Russia not want? See, uh, uh, Sangeeta, the whole, this, first of all, this is such a complex issue, such a complex issue that uh, unless you go into the historical aspects, we really can't uh, make out head or tail of it. And where does China come into this whole thing? Because China's far displaced from Ukraine and most people just wonder, how is China connected to all this, right? So the story really goes back to the Cold War. And we know that there was Warsaw Pact on one side, uh, which had the full backing of the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. And you had NATO on the other side with the full backing of the United States. It was a bipolar world, which had a good balance. Everything got upset in 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell. The Cold War came to an end. Two years later, the former Soviet Union uh, just imploded into 15 states, which are called the Commonwealth of Independent States, CIS. Ukraine was one of the very, very important ones. The granary of the former Soviet Union. It is also the industrial hub. In fact, most people would be surprised. Most of our T-72 tanks of India actually came from Ukraine. Uh, many much of our radio equipment, communication equipment actually also came out of uh, uh, Ukraine. But then 1991 onwards, the story changed. This was a victory for the United States and NATO, the Western world. And their uh, effort was to try and exploit it to the hilt as much uh, as they could. Many times, nations who win conflicts do not know how to make use of those victories. If you remember the Treaty of Versailles, 1919, how the Allies went after the, after the G Germans hammer and tongs, and that led to the resurgence of German nationalism. It brought about Hitler, and you saw sec the Second World War within 22, 23 years of uh, the end of the First World War, you had Germany again at war. So this is exactly the problem this time. The NATO attempting to push towards the former Soviet Union, taken to its control various nations which formed a part of the former Warsaw Pact, the former Soviet Union, almost 14 such nations and some of the republics of the former Soviet Union joined the NATO uh, alliance. Now, Russia was in no position to be able to resist this. It had weakened to such a great extent, it was not in a position to really resist this. And it was having a change of leadership from time to time. It was finding its feet all over. And suddenly you found that uh, a few years later, the push towards, towards Russia reached the what is called the limits of its tolerance. The red lines which uh, Russia had established. Russia was very clear. 
it could tolerate a, a onward movement by a NATO eastwards up to a point what it could not tolerate was entering into a country like Ukraine taking Ukraine under its uh, 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 under its cover uh, because Ukraine is geostrategically located in such a way that it is actually eating into the innards of Russia. You have the Slav population there, Russia, Belarus, or what was called uh, Belorussia at one time, now Belarus. Uh, this area is the Slavic area. And the Ukraine making a, making a, is almost like a dagger into this area. It cannot afford to do ha to have this. Therefore, the Russians started the pushback. And the pushback from 2014 onwards, which is what the next part of the story really is. And sir, uh, one of the most important factors which comes here is that uh, we have, you know, Russia wanting something. But uh, we also have this fact that, uh, you know, it is not Ukraine alone which is being wooed by NATO. So a lot of countries of the Cold War time, the, you know, the Iron Nation countries have become a part of NATO. So why so much of uh, pressure on Ukraine to not be a part of a larger global, uh, you know, world? I mean, it, it has all the rights. Absolutely. Uh, Sangeeta, what happens here is, as I said, 14 countries have joined. The eastward march of NATO. Uh, it's a free world. You can join NATO. But as I said, the former Soviet Union, the rump state of the former Soviet Union is Russia, the largest state, 140 million population, huge landmass. It has established a security. It has determined its security based on certain red lines. It can tolerate Many of these nations, for example, the Baltic states, many of the Baltic states, they're entering into, into um, the European Union or becoming a part of NATO uh, could be tolerated up to a point. Uh, nations such as Poland, Bulgaria, Hungary, etc., joining up, could, that could be tolerated. But Ukraine, as I said earlier, 48 million population, the granary uh, of, this, of this region geostrategically very important the geostrategic part is that a part of uh, ukraine that is crimea actually had the black sea fleet of uh, russia stationed at this very important port called sevastopol right and therefore if ukraine goes away to nato you find sevastopol will go to nato and where will the black sea fleet be where will, the, where, where will the Russian access into the Black Sea be? If the Russians cannot make an access to the Black Sea, they cannot make an access into the Mediterranean. And therefore, Russia is then restricted only to Vladivostok and the, and, and the, and the Pacific Ocean. Nothing to do with the Mediterranean, nothing to do with the Atlantic. Now, this is all geostrategics. And Ukraine is resting on the Black Sea. Therefore, Ukraine going away to NATO is something which the Russians cannot accept or tolerate. Right. And sir, uh, what are the pressures from Russia on NATO? The pressures from Russia on NATO, of course, you see, this is all about economics, the, the economics of the European theater. Remember that um, almost the entire gas for heating in winter in Europe, you, you know what temperatures in Europe are. So the gas for heating of uh, Europe all comes from Russia. There are different streams, streams of gas which come uh, uh, in, into parts of Europe. Europe hasn't got alternatives which have been created uh, to say that, okay, we can do without Russian gas at this moment. So the Russians have got that pressure on them. A major pressure is the economic pressure, the aspect of selling gas um, um, to the to the NATO countries. And that is something which the Russians are using to a great extent to put the screws onto NATO at this particular time. Right, sir. But one very important factor, sir, that gas does come from there. And when gas, uh, if, if gas does not come from Russia, we have a very major gas coming from Qatar. And uh, there is that the destination clause... Uh, for the Qatari pipelines will not work? And is Qatar under some pressure from Russia for that? Well, the infrastructure so far, well, of course, uh, Qatar, the Qatar gas lines are all there and, and uh, developing, but, but 
the the infrastructure which is required to support the whole of europe is is insufficient from that direction it is essentially the russian uh, uh you know connectivity of gas which is makes all the difference of course over a period of time development will take place and probably you'll find europe getting less and less uh, uh, dependent upon upon russia and one of the signs of that is the russians have already signed a 117 billion dollar deal with china the other day when uh, president putin visited beijing during the inauguration of the of the winter olympics so these are signals these are things of issues which will uh, take time to develop right sir and now that we've come to china sir why is China, you know, long time back, sir, I remember uh, reading that, uh, uh, you know, when uh, it was Mao and uh, he said, you know, that uh, China, when Russia, the Russian president said that India is a friend, but China is a brother. So when we were growing up, we heard of these things. So what, where does China stand? So suddenly... Putin goes to China and uh, Putin and she are having a, you know, it's a real camaraderie. I think it has already always been there. But then, you know, it's uh, strategically at the right time and the right occasion with the world all looking at you. And suddenly, you know, China, which, which is a common, absolutely the most commonest adversary everybody has in the world, suddenly, you know, in hand in glove situation with Russia. So what is this? Well, let's go back to 1969, perhaps. That's the time when, if you remember, Nixon came to India, President Nixon. He went to Pakistan and he had uh, negotiations, parleys in Pakistan, and thereafter flew back to Washington. You found subsequently ping-pong diplomacy starting off between China and the United States, in which Pakistan played a very important role as an intermediary. Uh, this was the effort by the United States at that time to break any kind of parleys, any kind of cooperation going on between the between the former Soviet Union and China. Uh, being communist countries, they were supposed to well have a common ideology and put could poss possibly uh, gang up together, team up together uh, against the United States. But that was not really happening at that time. You found in 1969, for example, in the month of May. You had one of the biggest exchanges of fire between the so former Soviet Union and China in a place called the Demansky Island on the Usuri River. 10,000 rockets were fired by the, by, the, by the Russians and thousands of Chinese soldiers were killed in that. They say the course of the Usuri River even changed. So the Russians were known to do big things and they were no great friends of the Chinese. But then they always say there are no permanent friends and are no permanent enemies and it's always interests which draw countries together. So what are the common interests at the moment of, the, of Russia and China? On one hand, Russia in 2014 entered into Crimea. It, uh, it uh, annexed Crimea primarily to save Sevastopol, to save uh, its Black Sea fleet. And uh, also it uh, threatened and influenced the eastern part of uh, Ukraine, where the Russian population, there's a Russian dominant population in that area. It uh, virtually took that under its, uh, under its cover and shadow in bringing huge influence here. From 2014 till 2021, the Russians have fought one of the world's long-standing and most effective hybrid conflicts, which means not going to war, but playing all kinds of different domains like cyber, economics, uh, uh, gas-related, uh, psychological warfare, and all kinds of things like that against the Ukrainian population so that to make sure that the Russian influence remains dominant here. In 2020, one later part of it, suddenly they decided that enough is enough. The Russians, the, the Russians Americans are not, or NATO is not adhering to what the, the Russians are trying to do. So they brought in 100,000 troops, uh, almost 1,200 tanks, and they have put this across on the borders, threatening to enter into Ukraine at any, any given time. It could be one of the world's um, very great conflicts of, of this particular century. But now, suddenly, you find that the Americans have withdrawn from Afghanistan. And uh, they are willing to risk a withdrawal from Afghanistan in a hurry. And they are also putting together various uh, is issues in the Middle East through the Abrahamic Accords. They have brought about, they brought about uh, peace between Israel, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and they hope to be able to stabilize this area. 
uh, freed from terrorism so that now you have Afghanistan potentially less risky and uh, uh, Middle East or West Asia comparatively less risky. Although I would always find Afghanistan being less risky as a debatable point. But this is what the United States was hoping for. And hope that hell that they could shift their focus to the rise of a not very peaceful China towards the Indo-Pacific. In the Far East, that's the area of the South China Sea, the area of the East China Sea, bring in the area countries which they have been developing relations with over a period of time, Japan, India, Australia into the Quad and things like that. But suddenly you find that on the doorstep of Europe, an area of great concern for the United States, where the Cold War was largely fought, suddenly you find a Russian buildup. Obviously, the effort is going on, the United States perceives, as if to draw away the attention from the Indo-Pacific and force, so that the United States is no position to be able to fight or place forces or bring focus into the Indo-Pacific to prevent the rise of China. Now we see the Chinese connection emerging. In this whole thing. If this is what China wants to prevent, all these years that Barack Obama wanted to shift uh, the focus to Indo-Pacific and he could not do it because of Afghanistan and because of Iraq, now that these areas are seemingly more stable, he would, the United States under Joe Biden was looking towards shifting focus into, into the Indo-Pacific. But once again, events have forced things to change. To, to be looked at differently. Europe is being be, be attracting all the attention. And the Chinese are hoping that Europe will continue to build up in this manner. Afghanistan will continue to be relatively unstable and hopefully something may happen in the Middle East too. That Whether all this has a Chinese hand behind it is, cannot be proved beyond uh, any measure. But obviously it is to Chinese interests that it is progressing in this particular way. And if we find greater tensions ratcheting up in uh, the Ukraine, in, the, in, in Europe, it is only going to be to, to China's great interest. And that is why President Putin is looking for balancing. He's looking for greater support from China. He knows that economically, he knows that sanctions will be imposed by the European Union, by the United States, that is going to economically affect uh, Russia. Uh, psychologically, he wants the support of China in the Security Council. So, for everything, he goes to Beijing and a very opportune time at the inauguration of the, of the Winter Olympics, which incidentally is being diplomatically uh, boycotted by the United States and, and, and many of the other important Western countries. And sir, uh, you know, when we talk of this, Russia is a great Indian friend. China is not a friendly nation. And when these two become friends, is that a positive sign for uh, India that whenever now China will think twice because Russia and India are friends, Russia will have some influence on uh, China, on its India policy. It, will that work? Is, this, is it a positive sign for us? You see, uh, what is happening is that uh, on one hand, we have a, we have a problem with, uh, we've, we've got uh, the United States wooing India all the time for uh, it's per for its own purposes to a great extent, strengthening up uh, the Indo-Pacific flank and uh, looking for Indian support of being a part of the Quad, uh, looking at the, at the maritime theater for the Indian Navy to probably ratchet up its own capabilities here. All this is part of the American strategy. At the same time, we have got our problems with China on the northern borders. China was attempting to coerce India primarily to ensure that our strategic confidence is hugely dented. And, and in the midst of all these dynamics, suddenly you find the Russians now. We were looking towards the Russians to stabilize and uh, sort of balance out our relationships. We took the S-400 uh, air defense weapon system from them at a cost of almost $5 billion dollars. Uh, we were looking at the United States being a part of the Quad. So both sides, we, India was the, was the balancing factor, really saying. Now this whole thing is getting upset to a great extent by what is happening is the Russians are looking to China for a great amount of support. 
the Indian India has abstained in the vote in the Security Council. The Russians haven't taken it very kindly. The Russians have invited Imran Khan to come and visit uh, Moscow. And although that should not disturb us unnecessarily, because nations have uh, the freedom to be able to interact and with each other, and leaders can visit each other's countries. But uh, these are signs, these are signals which which are which are there. The closeness of Russia with China is something that we will not be very very comfortable with. So we are walking a tightrope at the moment in our relationship with the United States, which is an emerging strategic partnership, and the old world relationship with Russia, which is very very important as far as this region is concerned, where Russia actually balances our friendship with Russia, balances out our enmity, our status of being adversaries with China. So we have to be extremely circumspect about the manner in which we progress these relationships, but we have to remain equidistant and all the time keep catering to our interests. Right, sir. Sir, that was wonderful, actually. And I'm sure it's given us and our viewers a very, very good insight into what exactly is the status quo as of today. Today is a very important day. There are a lot of things happening. We are expecting uh, some things to happen before the weekend. You know, you had Macron who was there and uh, that also be, I'm sure would make a difference and, you know, douse the fires a little. So eventually, sir, uh, my last question to you would be that uh, will the complete Europe as we see it today, see a change? Will we see it going somewhere in the you know past and uh, following a track where we had a very strong USSR and we had a very strong US and there was an iron curtain? Uh, do you see something like that happening now that Russia and US are at, at actually Russia and US seem to be at loggerheads, not Russia and Ukraine at the moment? So do you well, think actually, something is going yes. to repeat itself? Well, well that's, that's a very good question. Actually, you're absolutely right. It's, a, it's the Russia-US conflict, and in many ways, the Sino-US conflict, which is playing itself out in the European theater and with specifically with reference to Ukraine. It's a question of uh, trying to maximize the games and also play towards brinkmanship. The Russians, by bringing in, you know, the number of troops, 120,000 troops, 1,200 tanks, uh, trying to make it evident as if they are about to enter. Psychological warfare, they are all the time talking about blood being taken uh, to, to, to um, the, the deployed areas of where the Russian army is located at the moment. They expect a lot of casualties and things like that. Right At the same time, the Chinese are also uh, you know, looking at uh, the, the Southeast Asia, East Asia region, Today, coincidentally, is also the, the conference of the foreign ministers of the Quad, which is taking place in, in Melbourne. And it's a very important aspect that the pushback against China's very unfriendly and awkward kind of a rise in Southeast Asia and East Asia or uh, the area of the Indo-Pacific has to be contested. The United States is contesting it. But the problem is that, as we said earlier, there are attempts to try and take away the U.S. focus, take away its capability to operate here into other theaters of concern, such as the Middle East or the areas of Central Asia, Afghanistan, or even back to Ukraine, where, for example, 8,000 troops have you know, been pl placed on alert. Some troops have, the United States has, has flown some troops into Poland and other countries like that. So it, what is happening is focus is getting dissipated all over. And that's something which the Chinese is working to the Chinese favor to a great extent. Whether war will come in Europe or not, to my mind, superpowers or even former superpowers do not go to war with each other. You know, they like to see others go to war with each other, but they themselves will not go to war with each other. They will play this game through proxies. And that's why what you're seeing happening at the moment in um, in. Uh, and the European theater is essentially a tremendous brinkmanship, hoping like hell that the US and NATO will not, will not sit back and uh, the Russians will continue to push. So it's a question of a trigger. 
If a trigger takes place, then something may happen. But I don't think we are going to come to that situation. It's going to be more in hybrid terms that all these conflicts will be fought the world over. Thank you very much, sir. It was wonderful. And I'm sure our audience will love every moment of this interview. It gives us so much of an idea and insight into what is actually happening. You know, the common man is so worried. They are, they're thinking there's going to be a third world war. There's, you know, Russia is already at the brink of it and the US has all jumped into it. So I think this will sort out a lot of problems in the minds of the people who feel that, you know, it's something very, very uh, you know, terrible is going to happen in the second decade. Uh, and uh, we just hope, sir, that, uh, you know, things get sorted out and uh, things become better. And then we said we come back here with you and discuss what is the current status quo and where it's everything is nice and we are back to good terms and we are back to good terms. Let's hope we are back to good, the world is back to good terms with each other. I think that's a very big hope. But then we can always hope against hope, sir. So I think thank you very much, sir, for being here with us. And uh, we are now taking you back to Chitali, who's there with us in Cyprus. Chitali, back to you. Thank you thank so you. much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. As usual, a very comprehensive, to the point, and very interesting discussion. Of course, uh, nothing uh, else can be expected from you, sir. It is, it is, it is one of the best. Thank you so thank much, you sir. Very much, sir. Thanks for giving us your time. Have a nice day. All the very best. All the very best. Thank, thank you, sir. Right. Thank Bye. you, Jain. Jain, sir. Bye.